me, please rise. Thank you so much for being here. It's a delight to see you all this morning. For those of you joining us live streaming, we welcome you as well. Thank you for joining us for worship this morning. As you all know, we have started a series in Romans. This will be a wonderful journey for us all to take. And we as a worship team have a theme song for us for our journey through Romans. But before we introduce the theme song, I would like to share a scripture with you that fits just right with our song for today. In Galatians 2.20, God's word declares, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me powerful words from a powerful God. And that is the song that we're going to learn together and worship with, a song titled, Yet Not I, But Christ in Me. So let's sing together.
have a seat. We're getting ready to show a video from the Weiss family, our missionaries to Mexico. And this video is kind of precursor to, or it's actually a process of our faith promise drive that we do every year, where we as a church encourage you as members of Grace and attenders of Grace to consider how you can support missionaries that we support. We do not give out of our general fund offerings to our missionaries. It comes directly from you through pledges that you make. So whether it's an annual gift, a monthly gift, a weekly gift, we would ask you to think about how you can give above and beyond your normal tithes and offerings to specifically missions, what we call Faith Promise, here at Grace. Today you're going to get to meet Alvin and Sharon Weiss, okay? There's a little bit of a... Uh, an awkward moment in the middle of the video that we were not able to fix between first and second service. So bear with me, all right? I apologize for that, but it's there. But I want you to be aware of that. And so then afterwards, we'll talk about them just a little bit more. But go ahead, and Brian, and kick it off.
Greetings from Alvin and Sharon Weiss, your missionaries to Mexico. First of all, we want to thank you so very much for your faithful prayers and support. They are so important to us and so very greatly appreciated. As you know, last year was a very different year, difficult in many ways, and uh, the ministry was carried on remotely. Quite frankly, we left most of the preaching and teaching to our national workers, pastors, which after all is the aim of missions to have an indigenous work as much as possible. But we have contributed with devotionals, messages, and uh, have also spent many hours in communication talking over different aspects of the ministry. At the present time, we continue to support remotely, planning to return to Mexico as soon as possible. This may be delayed more than we thought because COVID still is on the rise there in the area of Mexico where we are. And uh, they're on lockdown. We can't have services even if we wanted to. And of course, uh, no physical presence in the school classrooms. And so everything is still being carried on online. One of the aspects of the ministry that is very dear to our hearts, and we ask for your prayers especially, is for the matter of our daughter, Alicia, and her husband, Oscar, being foster parents. They are currently fostering a 16-year-old girl and are meeting the challenges of helping her to overcome the past that uh, she has had to live through. So please pray for her, for her salvation, first of all, and that she will enjoy the new life in Christ. Once again, thank you from the bottom of our hearts, and we trust the Lord will bless you all very richly. So that was Alvin Weiss. You can see in the slideshow there that he's been part of nine church plants down in Mexico, which is an amazing thing that he's been part of there. So I want you to know that the monies that we send to these missionaries is being used for God's glory. It's not something that's just wasted or thrown away. It's for God's glory. It's for his purposes. And so we just appreciate your continued support of the missions through Faith Promise here at Grace. A little update for you. The foster child that they asked us to pray for here in this video, last week the praise was in our bulletin. We received an email from them last week, a week ago, that she has now placed her faith in Christ. She did that just about a week and a half ago. And so that is a huge praise for us. And, but do continue to pray for, her, for, uh, for their daughter, Alicia, as she and her husband, Oscar, raise this, this 16-year-old girl who's been in the foster care system and the challenges that some of you guys have experienced is hard, it's difficult. Um, so do continue to pray for them, but we do praise God for her new life in Christ. Go ahead and pull out your bulletins there. There's a couple things to be aware of, actually quite a bit going on. Uh, for those of you who've been past members of Grace for a while, you would recognize the name Wanda Frederick. She was part of our original building committee here that was started in 2007. Um, Wanda Frederick passed away this last Friday. Her visitation is this afternoon from 2 to 4 at Jacobs Mendez Funeral Home, and then the funeral is tomorrow here at church at 11. So if you guys are familiar with her and you would like to honor her memory in such a way, going to either vis the visitation or the funeral service, those are the times for that. Um, just, I'm going to throw this out now. You have to remember, help me remember too, we don't want to tear down chairs after service today. We're going to leave them up so that they be ready to go for the funeral service tomorrow. So just make a little note of that. Um, that will be tomorrow. Pray for me as I prepare the message for that. We'll be working on that yet tonight. Um, so just pray for that. There is a short Awana Leaders meeting tomorrow, so if you're in a Awana Leader meeting, we need you, or Awana Leader, we need you to come to that meeting tomorrow at 7, as we talk about the upcoming Grand Prix. There is a Voice of the Martyrs event happening this Friday, where at this Voice of the Martyrs, you're going to hear stories from persecuted Christians who've been incarcerated for their faith. 
It's going to be a powerful event, and we'd like you to come to that. This is Friday here at the church, 630. It's a simulcast. We want you to be part of that if you can. So just make a little note. If you can clear your calendar to be here, there's going to be some great stories there, some good stories for kids to hear, challenging them, of course, in their own faith, and us as adults as well. So if you can come to that, that's this Friday. And contact Shannon if you have any questions, or Dennis. They're both here in service today. Contact either one of them, and you can talk to them if you'd like to. We do have... Exciting news about next Sunday. Next Sunday, if you come at 11 for church, you missed it, okay? Now, for some of you, that may not be a bad thing. You think, wow, awesome, I missed Pastor Bear's message, okay? Don't say that to me because I don't want to hear it. But we are starting a regular service or a regular schedule that we had before COVID next week. So we're at 10 o'clock is worship, Sunday school at 1115. So next week, we'll be together as a church. It'll be great. I am so looking forward to it. Literally at about... What time was it, Kalina? It was about 7, no, 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 8.29 this morning. There were three people sitting over there, and there was one person sitting here, and that was it besides the worship team. Now, it filled in, okay, don't panic, it filled in, but man, at one minute before go time, I'm like, what in the world are we doing, right? Kalina gets up here, and there was nobody, it was just like nobody was here, and they came in, and they trickled in, and it was fun, but it was weird there for a minute, so it's gonna be nice to all be together as a family, so if you can, just come next Sunday at 10, all right, next Sunday at 10, stay for Sunday school, and then, uh, yeah, that would, we'd just love to have you guys be part of that with us. Yeah, Janet's excited. You know, you are not more excited than I on the worship team, though. Let me tell you, we are more excited than you. Yeah. Pastors only work one day a week, and I've been doing twice the work with no raise. I mean, where's the benefit here? I don't... <laughs> yeah. He says something about me being salaried, right? There's no... Thank you, Dennis. It's Dennis's first week back in months, and I already wish he was still home. <laughs> it's not true. Dennis, you know I love you, right? Oh, man. I was telling somebody this week, there was somebody I met this week. I'd only met him twice. He asked me to go ice fishing with him, which I, I've never really been ice fishing except for once when I was a kid, caught nothing. And uh, so we're out there talking, and he wanted to know what my church was like. I said, oh, man. I said, I'm up here talking, and they are interrupting me every Sunday, making fun of me some way, manner, or form. Thank you for holding me to be true on that one. So I appreciate that, Dennis. Oh, my goodness, guys. So next Sunday, one service, all right? Offering plates are available here at the front or in each lobby if you want to continue to give the Ministries of Grace into our missions program. Our building fund is getting down. We're getting there, guys. We are at 12273 and on a project that totaled 426000 that's pretty good over four years, guys. That's really good. That's really good. So we are getting close. We're getting close. We're ready for that one. Another praise, we have seven new Awana Clubbers have joined the last month. Seven new ones. That is really, really good. So that's a great praise as well. We're excited to have all those kids come. Pray for the Awana leaders. Pray for the teachers, for the volunteers. There's a lot going on there. Pray for them. As far as praise, uh, prayer items go, Chad DeCastro, he has surgery tomorrow. They're removing a kidney for cancer, and there's surgery tomorrow. So pray for him as he's going through that process. Pray for the surgeons. Pray for his healing and for his recovery. Uh, we just need a lot. Of, Chad needs a lot of prayer there. So if you wouldn't mind just lifting him up in prayer, we would greatly appreciate that. That's one that's not mentioned. And then pray for Janet and Philip Watkins. This is their last week living here in Nebraska. I was hoping to be able to be at church today. They weren't. This would be their last Sunday here. They're moving down south this weekend and uh, moving back to Texas, and so we will greatly miss them. If you have an opportunity just to give her a call or something, you need her phone number, let me know. If you want to just make a connection with them or Philip or with her or Philip, that would be fantastic. I know they would appreciate that, but they are moving this week, and so we are going to miss them a lot. So again, if you can, just drop them a note or something. I know they would greatly appreciate that, but do pray for them as they, as they move this weekend. They have a lot going on there. And then I think that's it for the things that weren't mentioned. Let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I, I thank you, wow, for bringing us together today. We've got a good crowd here this morning, and, and Lord, I praise you for that. I praise you for laughter. I praise you for humor. I praise you for the fact that we love each other enough that we can, that we can pick on one another, tease one another, and, and love each other through it. And, and Lord, it feels like a big family get-together, and it's great. And I thank you for this. I pray that you would be with some of these requests that were mentioned. We, we pray for the Weiss as they continue their ministry in Mexico. Please, please provide the financial needs that they have. Be with their daughter and son-in-law. Help them as they raise this, new, this, this 16-year-old child in, in her new faith. I pray that you would help them with the needs that they have down there. Lord, I, I pray for the Watkins as they're getting ready to move. Give them safety in their journeys. Help them to get everything done. And I just pray for them with the stresses of this. And we ask that Chad's surgery tomorrow would go 
would go well, to be successful. I pray you would meet that need too. God, for us as a church, as we're continuing on our ministries, I ask that you would help us to do this well. Guide us, Lord. Continue to be with us and walk with us through this process as we continue to make mature followers of Jesus Christ. And I ask this in Jesus' name, amen. In your bulletins, you're gonna find a little simple fill-in-the-blank outline. I challenge you to pick that thing up today. Today's message is going to be um, hopefully thought-provoking. That's what I want. I want a thought-provoking message for you. I got a call this week from one of my prayer team members, and he asked me, he, I mentioned in January, sent up prayer requests, mentioned in January, he's going to be going through Romans. And so he asked me, he said, how are you doing in Romans? And I kind of laughed a little bit. And I said, well, in February, we missed two Sundays because of weather. I had a vacation Sunday, and then, of course, the one Sunday that I preached, I did a snow day sermon because it was snowing outside, and it seemed fitting. So we are over a month in, and we're doing our second sermon. At this rate, we're going to be here until 2025, okay? <laughs> so hopefully, we're going to get through it a little bit quicker than that. But today is going to be a little bit of a review, but it's going to be another kind of a foundational study as we consider why God's Word specifically Romans, but God's word as a whole, by and large, why this is relevant to us today. We understand that studying God's word is good. We all get that. That's not an argument. Some of us struggle in how often to study or when to find time to study, making time to study, those different things. We understand that studying is good. Sometimes our study is going to take us to passages which people say are no longer relevant for today, which then leads to a rejection of some of God's word. We get that, and we know people like this, where they talk about different things. Well, that's, that's not, that was true back then, but not necessarily true for us today, all right? Romans is full of these types of passages. And Romans, when it starts, it's going to hit us really fast, really hard. The very first chapter of Romans talks about some very sticky things that our culture wants to reject. So to help us prepare for this tension, today we're going to look to establish, we're going to establish our basis for discovering truth, all right? For discovering truth, we're going to look at why we believe what we believe. And we're going to learn why Grace Church believes the Bible is still relevant today. In other words, why the Bible is still true. It's a philosophical sermon today is what it is. There's going to be a lot of philosophy in here, a lot of, a lot of thinking a little bit, maybe in a direction you haven't ever gone. But I hope it's challenging for you and I hope it's encouraging to you as we lay the foundation for why Romans is still applicable to us today. Why we can know that Romans is true. We're going to establish our, our basis for truth today. All right, reminders. Last month, that's really weird to say that, but it has been over a month. Last month, we learned that Romans was written when Rome was on the brink of rejecting Christianity. Okay? I want to put a little reminder course. Romans was written around 80, 55 to 80, 60, somewhere around in there. Okay? They're not exactly sure when, but somewhere in there between 80, 55 and 80, 60. What we know for certain is that in AD 64, two-thirds of Rome burned to the ground. Nero blamed the Christians and thus began the first global persecution of Christians by Rome. Rome was the world power, and they began to persecute all the Christians, Jews and Gentiles alike. They rejected Christianity. Romans was written just before that happened. Now, that may be timely for us today because I'm not much of a prophet, but I know times in America, they are a-changing, right? They are. We see different things happening. We know Christians, evangelicals as a whole, are concerned about the Equality Act that the House just passed this last weekend. Now, it hasn't gone all the way through Senate yet. We don't know what's going to happen. But we're nervous about this. We see different things shifting. We, too, need to be prepared for, what the, for possibly going through what the church in Rome had to endure, and Christians by and large. We also learned that Paul wrote Romans for three distinct purposes, all of which were to have an impact on the spreading of the gospel. It was missional, doctrinal, and pastoral. These are three things that's great to know, especially when persecution begins, all right? You got to know these things. Now, why is Romans so important to us as we think about this? Well, Chuck Swindoll says this. He says, the letter to Romans stands as the clearest and most systematic presentation of Christian doctrine and all the scriptures. I agree with this 100%. So when we think about persecution coming in, God knowing the future, just 10, not even 10 years not even 10 years before persecution was going to begin, he gave the Christian church a letter that was going to help them be missional, be doctrinal, and be pastoral in all their interactions as they were scattered around the world. I'm not saying we as a church are going to be scattered in America. I don't know what's going to happen. 
I'm praying that frankly we in America, we're not gonna face persecution like they did, but we might. And we need to understand that there is a letter, specifically the letter of Romans, that will help us be prepared for any sort of persecution. Help us be prepared in a missional aspect, on a doctrinal aspect, and on a pastoral aspect. Now, in the world in which we live today, okay, people inside and outside the church, just like it did in Rome, they want to reject the doctrinal purpose. They understand the missional part, right? They understand that different faiths, whatever faiths there are out there, whatever religions are out there, they understand the fact that they're trying to convert people to their faith, okay? They get that. By and large, they're not horribly offended by that. Sometimes they are, but by and large, not really, okay? But they want to reject that part. Or they, want, they can accept that part. They can accept the pastoral part, that, hey, we're supposed to love one another. We're supposed to be there to help one another. We're supposed to encourage one another. They get that. But the specific teachings that we find, especially in Romans, we find throughout the Bible, they struggle with some of the specific teachings. So they want to throw out the doctrinal part, which happens to be our foundation anyway. They don't want to throw that out. The ch- people inside the church People outside the church, in today's American culture, this Western civilization, they want to throw this doctrinal part out. So, knowing why our culture wants to reject this letter and why we should believe it, it's going to be helpful for us as we begin this series. Next Sunday, we'll be in Romans chapter 1. We'll get a few chapters, a few verses in, okay? Romans chapter 1. We're going to be looking at an introduction sentence that, if I recall correctly, was 132 words long. One sentence. 132 words. You think I'm wordy. Come on, people. That's a good sentence, all right? That's what we're going to talk about next week. But for now, we're laying the foundation, the foundation for why this book is important, why we know it's true. Robbie Zechariah says this. He says, there are three cultures in relation to absolute. I'm going to rephrase that just a minute. There are three cultures in relation to knowing truth, to establishing truth, all right? There's a theonomous culture, God law. The heteronomous culture, other law and the autonomous culture, self-law. That's what those words mean. Theonomous is God, theo is God, heter is another, auto is self. So we have theonomous, God law, heteronomous, another law, autonomous, self-law. Some of you, when I mentioned Rabbi Zacharias, you're thinking, why are you using him, okay? I'm going to say the same thing about Rabbi Zacharias that I'm going to say about, that a, that a New York editor said about the Democrats this last year, or this last week. Actually, this last week, he mentioned this. In a letter written about why schools should have been open in November, he was supporting President Trump. I know, New York Times supporting President Trump. This is crazy, isn't it? He said, just because Trump said it doesn't mean it's wrong. Just because Trump said it doesn't mean it's wrong. So there are people that we can disagree with on a lot of areas, but still understand that there are some things they say that's, that's correct, that's true. Ravi Zacharias, if you watching the news, you understand that there's some things he's done that we would disagree with. But a lot of his teachings are still good. They're still valid, which is why I wanted to use these today, because it's really good. This idea about a theonomous culture, heteronomous culture, and autonomous culture. Let's define these a little bit more. Theonomous, believing that truth comes from God and our moral code is passed down by God. We live the way we live because that's how God wants us to live. All right, that's a theonomous culture. Heteronom- okay, here's an example. Example of a auto- theonomous culture. When in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bonds which have connected them with another, to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them. All right, do you catch the premise down there? The assumption that there's nature and there's a God over nature? There is nature's God? There's an assumption that there is a God in the writing of this document, an assumption there is a God. Now, many of you already know what this document is. This next part's going to help you. We hold these truths to be self-evident. All men are created equal. Did you catch that? Created equal. Do you see the assumption there? Created equal. What's this next phrase? That they are endowed by their creator. Do we see this? The idea that we are created and that there is a creator over us. That's what we have with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the government. That's the Declaration of Independence, July 4, 1776. That's an example of a culture that's theonomous, understanding that God exists, and he gives us our moral code. That's a theonomous culture. If we were to have to write this document today, would those assumptions still be true that, that we are created and that man is, that there is a creator over us? No, I don't think we would. 
But at the time of this writing, there was that assumption that God existed and we were a product of God. We were created by God. That's a theonomous culture. Heteronomous culture, believing that truth comes from someone else. Our moral code is imposed by the outside, by another. On a stricter viewpoint, that'd be like communism, where they tell you what you can believe, they tell you where you can work, how you should spend your money, where you should go, all those different things. Communism is a, is a strict, strict application of this heteronymous culture. This is what you do. You are not allowed to share another perspective. We will shut you down. That's a heteronymous culture. On a lesser viewpoint, some have compared this to martial law, for example, where they come in and there's a lot of control given in your life, okay? We have a strict perspective, a lesser perspective, but both of these are heteronymous. Somebody from the outside directing your life. It's a heteronymous perspective. And then we have, finally, the third, the autonomous perspective. That's the autonomous culture. Believing that truth comes from inside ourselves and our moral code is imposed by what we personally believe is right. So theonomous, again, is God is truth. We get our truth from God. Heteronomous is I get my truth from whoever is over me. What they say is what I believe is true. Autonomous truth is whatever is true is what I believe is true. This results in relativism, which teaches that knowledge, truth, and morality exist in relation to culture, society, or historical context and are not absolutes. So they would say there is no such thing as absolute truth. Truth changes throughout time. What was true then may not be true today. Okay, what's true today may not be true tomorrow. Truth is always in flux. In short, there are no absolute truths. Do you believe that truth absolutely? It's a fair question. That's how I would ask that. Do you believe that truth absolutely? Because if you do, then you say... You say there's an absolute, and if there's one absolute, can't there be more? Well, there is no such thing as truth. Well, is that a true statement? Right? Do you see the fallacy of this philosophy? The world in which we live in today is autonomous in their philosophy. It's self-truth. But the fallacy is there. It's a house of cards. I don't believe anything. Well, it sounds like you believe that. Right? What their own belief, their own statements are illogical. They're not intellectually honest with themselves. It's broken. It's completely broken. And yet that's where we live today. And so what do we do with this? Because this is a problem, right? What's this result in? Well, here we go. So depending on our uh, culture we use as our framework, this will answer how we view and understand God's word. I'm going to paraphrase this for a second. I wish I'd have done this last night when I went over my message. I wish I'd have phrased it this way. Depending on what culture we use as our framework, we'll answer how we view and understand truth. Now, John 17, 17 says, sanctify them the truth, your word is truth, okay? So I'm using the term God's word and truth synonymously, but in today's conversation, we're talking about how do we know what is true? So I wish I'd have said truth. So in parentheses, if you want to write down underneath this in pen or pencil, in parentheses, just say truth. How do we get truth? How do we know what is true? Do we know it through a theonomous culture, through a heteronomous culture, through an autonomous culture? How do we manage this, all right? And so your framework is going to define this. So if I come to somebody in a conversation, and I am, am I heteronomous, and they're theonomous, it changes our perspective because they're looking at it completely different than I am. Or if they're autonomous, and I'm theonomous, again, they're completely different. And so we have two different frameworks trying to define something, and it's not going to work. Because we've got two different frameworks. Grace uses, surprise, surprise, a theonomous culture for our moral standard. We get truth from God. God tells us how we should live. This is what grace believes. We're theonomous. The world around us uses an autonomous culture. We are obviously going to clash. There's going to be parts where we're going to come together, we're going to say, well, this is what, I, this is what the Bible teaches well, I don't care what the Bible teaches. This is what I believe, right? Now, here's, here's the tough part. Because when we disagree, we act as if we live in a heteronymous culture. In other words, what I believe, you must also believe. All right? Christians, we aren't the best at this. Sometimes we begin conversations, somebody from church said this week, sometimes we begin conversations, well, this is what I think. Forget that. And he told me, that, he said, we shouldn't begin a conversation with this is what I think. We should begin a conversation with this is what the Bible says. 
That's what somebody who believes in theonomous culture will, will start with. This is what the Bible says. Argue with the Bible, not with me. All right, so we are bad at this. Well, this is what I think. And therefore, because this is what I think, this is what you must believe. People in the autonomous culture do the same thing. Yes, you can believe whatever you want to believe, and that's what you believe disagrees with what I believe, and then you must believe what I believe. Because now we live in a heteronomous culture. We're passing down my beliefs upon you. But again, intellectual dishonesty. If they truly say that it's self-law, that whatever you believe is true, then whatever I believe is true. It's true to me. You can't argue with me against it. You have no basis for argument. None. You should not be trying to convince me of anything because you yourself say there is no truth. Now, if there's no truth, then how, how is there anything? As one person, well, let's dive into this just a little bit more. All right. Partial solution. Now, <laughs> I just said that when a Christian talks about this, they should say, this is what God's word says. Never begin a conversation with this is what I think. And I begin a conversation with this is what I think. All right? Forgive me for this, okay? But this conversation is based on biblical principles. All right? Now, I am sharing my opinion here a little bit. There's some philosophy here, but there's some biblical principles I want you to get from this, okay? Understand this. Both belief in God and rejection of God takes faith. Both have large implications, there's a book out there titled, I Do Not Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist. It takes faith to be an atheist. Think about this. All right, here's the thing. I believe in God. What are the implications behind that? Well, there's a God who wants me to live the way he wants me to live. There's a God who's promised a coming reward and a promised judgment on those who follow them and those who reject him. These things are coming. That's a large implication. Now, what if I reject God? What are the implications of that? The implications of that is that I'm hoping that there isn't a coming judgment. That is also an implication. So either as my faith in God teaches me that this one's coming, or my rejection of God says to me, I hope the one isn't coming. They both have large implications eternally, right? It's like I've asked before, what if I'm right? What if I'm right in this whole process? Well, if I'm right, there is heaven, there is hell, there's punishment, there's reward. These things are guaranteed if I'm right. What if I'm wrong? What do I lose? Nothing. I die and that's the end. I had a pretty good life. I had purpose here on this earth. It was great. And then I died and I didn't even know I died. I just died and there was nothing. Do you see the implications here? By believing in God, I recognize that there's a way I should live honoring to God. By rejecting God, I'm hoping, I'm not going to use the word praying, but I'm hoping there is no God. Both of those take faith. I have faith there is a God, I have faith there isn't a God. Both of them take faith. Think about this. Because of my faith in God, because of my faith that there is a creator, I know what? I know where I come from. I can look in Genesis chapter 1, I can look at Genesis chapter 2, and I can see very clearly where I come from. My faith answers where I come from. My faith answers how I should treat others. I should love one another. I should love, I should love my brothers. I should love my enemies. It, treats, it tells me how I should treat my wife, how I should treat my kids, how I should treat others of, uh, people of other race, how I should treat those above me and those beneath me. The scriptures are very clear. I will say that over history, churches, Christians, have sometimes, or maybe even more often than not, misinterpreted some of these passages where the man was definitely head of the house, right? Well, okay, he had more responsibility. It doesn't mean he was better than the woman. He had more responsibility than the woman. God gave him the responsibility. God did not make him better. They are peers. She is his helper, Genesis 2 says. A helper, not a bad thing. It's a good thing. Scriptures are very clear how she treat. So don't disregard the scriptures just because God's followers misinterpret the scriptures. God, the author of God's word, is perfect. My interpretation may not be. But my faith in God answers where I come from and what I should do. That it does. Let's think about this. What if I reject God? What is the one theory today that answers these questions without God involved? Evolution. All right? If I'm going to ask where I come from and God is not part of the equation, the only thing I have left to turn to at this moment is evolution. Can we agree on this? All right? This is what's taught. There's really no other option. So evolution and rejection of God teaches we only live for ourselves and what is best for our kind. Survival of the fittest. Is any of this ringing a bell? Do you guys catch where I'm going here? All right, I'm not wrong, am I? 
Y'all did kill me. Okay. We're going to assume that I'm right, just for kicks and giggles. All right? What is best for our kind? Survival of the fittest. If you believe in evolution, let's take that to the logical conclusion. Take it to the logical conclusion. All right? Evolution does not support world relief. If you believe in evolution, you should not be behind any cause like this. Why? Because those people aren't your kind. They're a, they're a whole other race. A whole, nother, a whole other ethnicity. You want what's best for you and your people. They're just taking resources you could actually use for your people's benefit. Let them die off. Isn't that the logical conclusion when you take it to the clear result? Socratic line of reasoning is what it's called. Begin asking these questions. This is what evolution teaches. Then why would I do this? It's a house of cards. Evolution does not support racial equality. Again, the same thing. If one race is superior to another race, such as Adolf Hitler believed, who was also a follower of Charles Darwin, he only took it to the logical conclusion. And the world hates him. But he took it to the logical conclusion. Evolution does not support gender equality. Direct quote, Charles Darwin. The chief distinction in the intellectual powers of the two sexes is shown by man attaining to a higher eminence. And whatever he takes up, then woman can attain. Thus, man has ultimately become superior to woman. Can you imagine somebody writing this today and trying to get his feet off the ground with a theory of where we came from with this perspective? Jesus Christ would not be the only one crucified, would he? We sit there and we look at this. We ignore some of the teachings of this man, which were so blatantly wrong, countercultural, yes, but counterbiblical, completely contrary to God's word. You say, well, okay, now wait a minute, Pastor. At the beginning of the message, you said just because it's, it's uh, President Trump doesn't mean he's wrong. Maybe, maybe, maybe this guy, maybe Charles Darwin had some things that were right. Maybe he's still right on the whole theory of evolution. Okay, but I'm not trusting in President Trump for my eternal security. I'm not trusting in Charles Darwin for my eternal security. I'm trusting in the author of God's word, not my pastor who interprets it, not my Sunday school teacher who interprets it, but God himself. That's who I'm trusting in. And so if you choose to reject God, then essentially you're putting your whole eternal security in a man by the name of Charles Darwin who wrote a book that was unsupported and made comments like this that we look at and say, that's ridiculous. And you cannot misinterpret this comment. How do you change it to say something other than what it says? That man has ultimately become superior to woman. What's he saying there? Man's become superior to woman. Well, what could he mean by that? Man's better than woman. Oh, well, that makes more sense. That's better. What do you do with this? But in our haste and our desire to reject God, we find ourselves somewhere that frankly does not stand up in court. But this is where we are. Homosexuality is contrary to both scriptures and evolution. People are like, well, I'm not going to be a Christian. I'm not going to follow the Bible because that whole thing they teach against homosexuality and, and that's, just, that's just how we're made. Catch that made? Where'd that come from? How are you made this way if you reject God? Anyway, different, different idea. But what does homosexuality teach? We were just at a museum in Lincoln a week and a half ago. And there, and I quote, they had this phrase, the animals experimented. So we're talking about evolution. The animals experimented. So what's the understanding there? What worked was passed on to the next generation. What didn't work literally died out, okay? If your wings weren't big enough and you jumped off a cliff to test them, that didn't work out so well for you, did it, if you were an animal, right? So then, okay, that didn't work. The next generation hopefully will develop something a little bit better. That's really what evolution teaches, right? We understand this. I don't want to be crass. I don't want to be crude. But homosexuality, by definition, according to evolution, is weeding out a bad gene because they are not reproducing. We ignore these things. God's word tells me how I should treat everyone, even those I disagree with. Evolution teaches get rid of them. Get rid of the bad, only keep the good. Which is exactly, once again, what Hitler was trying to do. 
He was only following evolution. It was a logical conclusion. And yet nobody says these things. Why? Because you can't say that. Why can't I say that? It's a culture we live in. You just can't say those things. It's hurtful. It's hateful. It's unloving. It's called hate speech. And it is. My sermon today, in some states, would be considered hate speech. There may come a time in Nebraska that will be as well to say these things that I just got done saying. Guys, we have to communicate. Absolutes do exist. There is such thing as absolute truth. There is. I don't believe in truth. Do you believe that statement? There are no absolutes. Do you believe that? Absolutely. We must be able to communicate that there are absolutes and that whatever it is they believe, it takes faith as well. And they must, you cannot convince them of that, but understand that that's where they're coming from. That if there's someone who's not a theonomous culture, heteronomous culture, autonomous culture, all three cultures take faith. All three cultures take faith. All three cultures are built, whether they like it or not, are built on absolutes. But many of them, especially auto, the autonomous culture, rejects that idea. Absolutes do exist. Love does not equal acceptance. We as Christians right now are being cast out because you guys are just being so hateful and so hurtful to all these people. You don't accept them for who they are. John 3, 16 is the most famous verse in the Bible. Let's think about that verse with the idea that love equals acceptance. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son for no reason at all because he accepts us anyway. That he gave his only son for no reason at all because he accepts us regardless. Christ died for no reason if love equals acceptance. Let's do a case study. Genesis. If you want to turn there, you can. The verse is going to be on the screen. Genesis chapter 4, verse 1. Adam knew Eve, his wife. She conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. Again, she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain a worker of of the ground. Verse 3 says this. Verse 3 gives us this idea that Cain displeased God. Here's what we read. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock, of their fat portions. The Lord had regard for Abel and his offering. Verse 5 on the screen. But for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. Abel brought an offering of his flocks. Cain brought an offering from the field. What's the issue here? Well, when you back up to Genesis chapter 3 and you see the fall, when Adam and Eve first sinned, God required there to be death. God himself killed an animal, a sacrificial animal. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22, when you fast forward there, Hebrews 9, 22 says, without the shedding of blood, there could be no forgiveness. If I could paraphrase Genesis chapter 4, verse 5, but for Cain and his offering, God said, Cain, you can't get blood out of a turnip. Right? Read between the lines. You can't get blood out of a turnip. You can't. Cain wanted his actions to be accepted, but God cleared this up in a hurry. Check out this dialogue that happens. Cain was very angry, and his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why has your face fallen? How many people do we know that get angry when confronted with something they're not doing right? Well, me, I'm one. Okay, can I be that way? I don't necessarily like being confronted with things I'm doing wrong. And my wife, who is a glorious helper, I love my wife. Sometimes she's very good at helping me, telling me what I'm doing wrong. And I always receive it so well. <laughs> why are you guys laughing? Now I'm getting angry at you guys, all right? We understand this. Nobody likes being confronted with things they do wrong. And, we, and who do we get angry at? We get angry at the confronter, not the problem that we did, right? We get angry at the confronter. Check out this very next verse. This is key. Verse 7. If you do well, will you not be accepted? If you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you. You must rule over it. What is God saying here? You can displease God and not be accepted. 
So I wonder if John 3, 16 should actually be interpreted as is read. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Whoever believes in him should not perish, have eternal life. Why would he give his son? Because, because we are not accepted as we are. There must be a blood sacrifice. And Christ was that sacrifice. Sin results in death. Sin results essentially in separation from God. This is what we know. There was a punishment, but God still loved Cain. You can love and not accept somebody. How do I know this? Look at the next verse. Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you have driven me today away from the ground, and from your face I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. I'm a dead person, God. I thought you cared for me. I'm a dead person. Look at, the, look at what's happened. And God said to him, not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest any who found him should attack him. Did God take away his punishment? No. Did God care for him in the middle of his punishment? Yes. Yes, he did. Did God love Cain? Yes, he did. Did God accept what Cain did and say, oh, you know what? That's okay, buddy. You are a farmer. You were made to be a farmer, and that's what you do, so it's okay to go ahead and offer that as a sacrifice. No. No, no, no. We are created in God's image. We are created to please God. That is our purpose. And sin is crouching at our door. If somehow we think that love equals acceptance. I look at this verse. Look at the verse before it and the verse after. And the verse after teaches this especially. Sin always results in separation from God. You can be a Christian. And you can live your life however you want to live. But let me tell you, God does not necessarily accept your actions. And you could be separated from God as far as a Christian can get. You can be separated from God even as a believer. Not eternal separation. not saying you're not going to get to heaven. But I'm saying your fellowship with him is completely broken. It's gone. What's the next verse saying? Then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. How many of us like right now are living our lives away from the presence of the Lord. Because we think, you know what? I can do whatever. God's just going to accept me. Because God's a loving God, he's just going to accept me. It's not what the Bible teaches. That's not what the Bible teaches. There are consequences to sin. God's love is unconditional. God's acceptance is not. Those are two completely different things. Do not confuse the terms. I have four children. Anybody here who has children, you understand this, what I'm about to say. I have four children. I love my children deeply. Do I always accept what my children do? I'd be crazy to, right? I do not. They know those times. Do I still love them in the middle of it? Absolutely, I do. We see the logic of this played out in our lives, and yet somehow the, the world around us wants to twist this. And we are unwilling or unable to refute it. Love does not equal acceptance. It just doesn't. Guys, I want you to know, our study in Romans is going to get real. It's going to get very real. We're going to get down to it pretty quick. As we think about this study, as we dive into it, as we walk through it, you guys know the lessons from Romans, they come from God, not from me. To the best of my ability, I'm going to preach exactly from God's word and very clearly show you this is what it says. What do we do with it? If there's a part in there that's hard to understand, I will tell, we, I will tell you this is my opinion. That's my promise to you. If there's something in there that, that people disagree on, I will tell you, okay, here's where people disagree. Here's where I landed. You go wherever you want to go on this, but this is what God's word says. Stay within the parameters of God's word. You must stay within the parameters of God's word. That's what we have. Man cannot dictate to God what God meant to say. Well, if God lived now, he wouldn't say it like he did. He changed this. If God lived in our culture today, he would understand my un how we live, and, and so he would change things a little bit. No, we don't get that. We don't get that right. That's not ours. We cannot dictate to God what God meant to say. So my question is, for all of you then, are you going to listen to him? Not to Pastor Bear, not to Chuck Swindoll, not to anybody else. Are you going to listen to God as his word is presented? Because sometimes I screw it up. 
The interpreters are known to screw up what the author has to say. My author is perfect. My interpretation is not. We are the one faith in the whole world who has a perfect author. Not saying we live it right. Not saying we even interpret it right all the time. But we have a perfect author. John 17, 17. I quoted it once and here it is. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Are you going to commit to listen to what God says? Not what our culture says. Not what your neighbor around you says. Not what your kids say. Not what your parents say. Are you going to listen to God's word? That is the question as we dive into Romans. Lord, help us. Oh God, help us. We are living in a world where we have values that are twisted and we have, with a lot of things are just messed up and, and frankly, even within the church and, and God, we need your help. As we dive into this series on Romans, help us to be able to understand where we are coming from. Help us as individuals to think about, wait a minute, what do I believe? And then to take that to its, to its logical conclusion to go all the way through with it, Lord. Not just reject what we want to reject and accept what we want to accept because if we're to go one direction, we need to go all the way and God help us to be able to go all the way. Help us to be consistent in our lives. Lord, most of all, help us to have faith in you. This whole process, and I ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Please rise.
you that you are crowned in glory to glory. Thank you that you are holy. As your followers are not, but Lord, we want to live in a way that's honoring to you. We want to become conformed to the image of your son. We want to become mature followers of Jesus Christ. God, we're going to need your strength. We're going to need your grace. We're going to need your wisdom. We're going to need your spirit. Help us, God. Help us, Lord, to be the people you want us to be for your glory, not for our own. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There are some food items.